Okay, it's time to get started. Uh, please welcome to Why Not Just Bridges? What do sector solutions bring to the table? That's our webinar today. Thank you so much for spending <clears throat> your time with us. We're going to get started. So I'm going to introduce our presenter today, Susie Johnson. Susie? Hi, everyone, and uh, thanks, Leonard, for introducing. Welcome, everyone, and thanks so much again for joining us today to Why Not Just Bridges. Um, as many of you know, the Bridges Out of Poverty strategies for professionals and communities and the participant component of Bridges being getting ahead and just getting by world uh, are going strong across many communities. Um, and today we wanted to talk about how Bridges has evolved over the last 20 years, uh, which is including a lot of different sectors in our audiences and within our communities who are showing interest. So as the audiences have expanded, uh, to include lots of different sectors and best practices have been created. Uh, we wanted to share a little bit with you about the tools and strategies that have been developed uh, to match the needs of our audiences. So joining us, we do have, uh, there are, are five other AHA process consultants who are going to speak a little bit about the work that they're doing in their communities and the sector involvement that they've been um, having some success with and will take questions and answers throughout um, the uh, presentation. So first of all, we wanted to uh, explain the Building Bridges uh, uh, community slides so that we could talk a little bit about the solutions that are being offered for uh, under-resourced as well as e resource individuals as the work has been expanding. Um, the solutions uh, for the community, as you know, are again, our bridges out of poverty and bridges to sustainable communities, bridges across every divide, and equally uh, happening as the getting ahead workshops for our under-resourced individuals and communities. K-12, Sharon Ray is going to speak about uh, in a few minutes around some work that's happening in her community in that sector. Uh, we also have our workplace sector of workplace stability uh, and getting ahead in, uh, getting ahead in the workplace that Nathan Mansegger is going to speak about today as well. Uh, we have work happening in our criminal justice uh, sector, and Gary Reddick is joining us to talk about tactical communications. And then in healthcare, we have Bridges to Healthcare, uh, which Terry Drusy Smith has joined us, who is co-author of that book, and we'll speak to her experience around that workshop. Uh, higher education also is another sector uh, of work that's happening with the AHA process and investigating uh, into economic class, which is happening for under-resourced individuals as well. So that's a little bit of our outline of what we're going to do today, and we'll get started with Sharon. Hello, everybody. Um, hope everyone's having a great day. Um, I just wanted to speak with you a little bit about how um, I've used a framework for understanding poverty, emotional poverty, and also the resources um, that the, the resource-based um, strategies. Um, I have been part of the Together Initiative in Lancaster County um, for about six years, and we had, um, together, we had uh, social services agency, school district, um, the faith-based organizations all coming together to work. Um, and in the last six months, I have moved to a different position and am currently the principal at a charter school in Pennsylvania. And with that, I've been able to take um, the approach that we've used um, and, and all of this this work that, that Ruby and everyone has done and started applying it to a different community, um, if you will. Um, in, whereas now with the charter school, we have six different districts that we are catering to with very different demographics. Um, so it, this is kind of like starting all over again. Um, so if you want to advance the slide for me. Thank you. Um, one of the, the first things that I've done with my staff here is uh, talking about um, language and story and how they do impact thinking school and work. Um, and not only with the students that we are working with, but also their families. Um, and that is something that is so useful for in education 
because we're not just working with the students on a daily basis, we are working with their families as well. And how we communicate with one another can make or break a relationship. Um, so we have, um, uh, as our staff is reaching out to, to families and they're coming from, like I said, one of the different districts, they may be going back and forth in registers as they're making phone calls. And um, it, so part of my work is teaching the staff about this, that there is a difference and that what our goal is, is to th teach the students that school and work are are in this formal register and although they may live in a casual register world we need to teach them how to um, to live in the formal register world as well um, if you want to go ahead and advance the slide then um, and and then another piece that we take and I'm looking at now this was so embedded in the community that I came from um, like I said we were um, faith-based and and school churches everybody all together and we were all working together um, and so students and families were getting these skills from a multitude of um, areas whereas now like I said it's kind of starting all over again but the actions to educate students are so incredibly important um, because not only do we have our action but the why behind it and what we keep learning over and over and over again is the importance of relationships and that goes with um, with our students once again and our families and so how do we build the relationship of trust um, mutual respect between and among one another um, and teaching the why as to why we do this and that helps our students be just become more productive citizens then um, as well and then we can reach out to the other agencies in our community um, let's say you know one particular school district that I, I'm recognizing that there's some issues with the students that are coming from that school district I can reach out to the agencies there and share this information with them as well so we're all speaking the same language um, do you want to advance? <clears throat> the other um, layer that we have we have put on top of this as well is the emotional poverty piece, um, and this is good. This is so valuable for all of our students because with emotional poverty, we're not just talking about financial poverty. Um, Ruby explains that emotional poverty is extremely uh, prevalent in affluent areas as well. So, what are the uh, issues that our students are bringing to us and how can we best help them and support them understand where the behavior is coming from and help them recognize the behavior and move past it as well would you like to advance the slide for me thank you okay um, and this is like I said the why behind and um, this is one of my favorite quotes from the book too is consequences will always be needed it is that a, it is the approach that changes um, and working with the staff to understand that it's not just about it's not punishment consequences look all different ways um, and we will hold the students accountable for their behavior but how we approach them based on where they're coming from and what their needs are will be different um, so behavior it happens for different reasons um, and we as educators need to understand that so we can best support our students So Great. that is my slides. That, that's the end of Sharon's uh, presentation. Just one question, Sharon. Are you training all of your uh, staff at your school in emotional poverty and framework yeah. for? Yes. Work? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, we, yeah we're, we're taking it slow because it's something new. Like I said, I'm, I'm brand new. So this is new work coming into it. So we, I'm listening to them and I'm hearing what their needs are and then I am embedding that into everything that we do is that underlying framework and emotional poverty as well right okay great thanks very much uh, next up we're gonna have uh, treasure sorry I forgot to mention that treasure treasure McKenzie is going to present uh, related to getting ahead and getting by world and some work with staying ahead that her community uh, is uh, undertaking at the moment 
Hello, everyone. Good morning. This is Treasurer McKenzie with um, Muskogee Bridges Out of Poverty out of Muskogee, Oklahoma. We have been a Bridges community for about nine years, and we love our community, and we love that the community has all come together using all of the sectors to support Bridges and the work that we do. Um, I am, we are supported by a grant, and we have me, the director. I have an English-speaking success coach, Sheena, and a Hispanic speaking success coach. Her name is Yesenia. And next slide, please. So as you can see, we do the getting ahead and the just getting by world classes for those families in our community that are in poverty, wanting to transition to middle class. We have held 18 English speaking classes and 12 Spanish. We do have our classes in 20 weeks every Tuesday night. We do them in semesters, kind of like school. So we have a class that starts in August. They will graduate in December. We have a class that will start in January. They will graduate in May. We feed the whole family a healthy meal prior to class so no one goes hungry. And then the class starts at 6 o'clock p.m. and goes to 8.30. We hold our classes in a large church in town. And we do have a paid child care um, staff to work with the children because we are doing a generational approach to this and we want to make sure that we are addressing all generations when we're trying to address um, poverty. Our Getting Ahead graduates, we call them investigators, get a $25 gift card to Walmart at the end of the month for every class that they attend. So they get about a $100 gift card um, at the end of the month. That is a couple reasons. One, because um, they, they are giving us their time, but also they are sharing crucial data with us about what it's like to live in poverty in our community that we may not know. Those are things that our steering committee can address as a community, maybe go to City Hall and get some policies changed. Um, we are funded by a five-year grant, and that is one of the biggest blessings to our organization because as the director, I do not have to spend my time fundraising. I can truly spend my time helping people and educating the business community about the complexities of poverty in Muskogee. And so if you have if you're wanting to become a Bridges community and do getting ahead classes, there are grants out there and the longer the grant, the better. It really brings a stability to our organization that we don't have to worry about that so much. So, so far in the nine years, we've graduated 383 people from our classes, but think of that as 383 families that have been um, improved in some way through the getting ahead classes and we every summer we call all of our graduates and ask them how they're doing we kind of tried to get some outcomes from them and we have some really great outcomes 85 percent of our graduates report that they have increased their income 88 percent have reported that they have decreased their debt since taking the class 81 percent have increased their education in some way and 76% of our graduates now say they are banked. They've opened a checking or a savings account. But the one that I think is the, the most important is the 75% of our graduates that say they are now self-sufficient. That means they are off social services and everyone knows how hard it is to get off social services. And so that equals stability. These people are getting jobs and keeping these jobs and they're, and they're getting stable housing and they're just getting their life back on track. In 2016, Muskogee was named National Bridges Community of the Year, and we're at the National Convention in Orlando. We're so excited about that and thankful, um, and we're excited to be leading one of the leading communities in the Bridges work. Next slide, please. And so after the um, graduates take the, the getting ahead and a just getting by world class, they are hungry for more information. And so we've created a staying ahead program and every community's staying ahead program looks different. Our graduates specifically asked for financial literacy classes and parenting help. And so we created Money Matters 101, which is a basic financial literacy class that is paid for by our local banks. A boundaries class, which all people in poverty need healthy boundaries and know when it's okay to say yes, when it's okay to say no, the difference between hurt and harm, and parent university. And I'd be happy to share all any of this information with anybody who's interested in learning more. But um, this is just something that we have every Tuesday night while all of our classes are going on because we already have um, a food team cooking the meal. We already have paid childcare and we have classrooms available. So we hold our getting ahead and our staying ahead classes on the same night. We also have a car donation program where people donate vehicles to our organization. We repair them and sell them to a graduate for $500, no matter 
how much the car is worth. That uh, addresses the barrier of transportation to a family. That program's been working out very well. And then because we're a 501c3, the donor gets a tax write-off. Um, we also have free dental, free vision, and free hearing for our graduates. A lot of times the people in our classes sometimes have um, poor dental health due to maybe a, um, a drug addiction in the past. And so that is kind of one of those barriers they don't seem to be able to overcome on their own that we can help them with. And so can you imagine going to a job interview with a new set of teeth um, and the confidence that would give you and, and being able to hear and see you, the, an application to fill out your FAFSA to go back to college. And so that is a wonderful service that we're blessed to be able to offer. And last, we have free attorney services. Now this is an attorney that we have a, a contract with in our community that only deals with civil cases. So things like child, um, custody, divorces, adoptions, um, immigration issues, things like that, there's something that we can address. And in fact, just yesterday I had a report that we had a graduate who um, had didn't realize she hadn't paid the taxes on a new house that she had bought. And it, her house went to auction, got sold for $300, and a man knocked on her door and said, um, I own your house now. And our attorney was able to reverse all that and get her house back. And so that's a huge thing sometimes. This, this person also was not English speaking. And so there was a, a, a barrier there for language. So that is what our program looks like in Muskogee. Everyone's program looks like differently, but we are so excited to be a part of the AHA process and Bridges program. And that's all I've got, guys. I'd be happy to take any questions. Wonderful. I think we'll uh, we'll take some questions as well at the end for anyone who's gathering their, their questions of the presentations and the sector work that we're doing. Um, sounds like some phenomenal work there that is happening at your end. I just have one question around your intake for staying ahead. Is it just a rotating intake then as grads, like you said, they're running simultaneously. And so as you finish up the group in December, if you've got a staying ahead already running with some previous grads, do they just sort of join in as they graduate? Every class starts at the same time, and so based after you've getting after you've taken the getting ahead class, you may not have children, so you might want to take the money matters class, or you may have kids that you need the parent first day. So there's no order; you can take them in. You can sign up for anyone at any time. Right. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Next up, we have Nathan, who's going to speak around uh, workplace stability and faith-based work that's happening in their community. Hi there, everyone. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yep. Yes, we can All right. hear you. Yep. Got it. Okay. So, uh, great to be on the webinar today. Um, I'm excited to be able to talk a little bit more about workplace stability. Uh, here in Schenectady, uh, New York, uh, upstate New York, and the wider capital region, we have a tri-city area here. We have uh, been a part of uh, Bridges' work for probably well over 10, 15 years, probably closing in on. So uh, we latched on uh, to Bridges Out of Poverty initially and then have started to integrate some other pieces. Uh, about seven or eight years ago, uh, I started to lead a division of our organization that really focused on business and employment services. And as we uh, launched our employer resource networks and some different strategies to support business success and employee success, um, we were talking to AHA Process about uh, what kind of product might be able to be, uh, air quote, translated better for the employers. And so uh, talking with Ruth uh, over the the years that she was developing workplace stability, it, it really became a great tool for us in um, bringing two businesses that we were working with, both for-profit and non-profit businesses, um, some language, some strategies that would really uh, be applicable to uh, their efforts to not only hire and uh, recruit and hire employees, but to keep them on the job, that retention, the motivation, the ability to stay focus on the job. So uh, we've been doing workplace, uh, you can flip to the next slide, sorry. Uh, we've been doing workplace stability now uh, for the last couple of years uh, and have really begun to gain some traction with employers across our region. Um, obviously, when we go in, we're targeting um, and offering this to uh, manager, super, supervisor level um, 
employees at different uh, businesses. And the idea really, just like Bridges Out of Poverty, is to uh, offer a framework for better understanding of their workforce, of the challenges that they feel every day, and putting some language um, and some tools and paradigms around that. So uh, when we do these trainings, we often start with this graphic, just kind of uh, level setting this idea that uh, for individuals, for employees that they have to be stable, um, there's a whole bunch of environmental uh, realities, resource realities, what neighborhoods those employees are coming from, how they get to work, that kind of stuff, as well as the hidden rules of the workplace, uh, the language barriers, as was alluded to earlier, um, kind of just what may, motivates and engages an employee that maybe is coming from a different perspective and in a different environment. And then we always show that if you look at those two areas, you, you then also, if you work hard at it, there's great opportunity to improve retention rates, improve performance, and all of that's going to feed greater profits too. And so I think this oftentimes, this picture gives a, a good starting point for managers and supervisors um, and business leaders in general to understand that you can't, it, it's not an either or discussion. It's not, um, you can't discount what people's personal lives and environments and resources um, are, are looking like uh, and, and just expect them to show up to the job and, and perform well. You've got to take into account the full picture. Um, the next slide shows kind of the, um, the resource reality. Uh, and again, uh, with workplace stability, we've been able to translate um, some of the ideas from Bridges Out of Poverty and Framework to the workplace. And so we're defining under-resourced, unstable, and high-stressed employees as those to which the extent of those individuals are doing without resources. And again, it becomes an easy conversation whenever I'm doing these trainings with managers and supervisors, is to look at this quick snapshot of, of a variety of resources um, that all have to, in some way, work together and synergize. For instance, for all of us to be sitting in a training today, for all of us to be uh, present on this webinar, um, whether uh, it's the relationships and role models that we have in our lives that help us get to work every day, um, the, the ability to exercise, which allows us to cope better with, with um, challenges and situations, the support systems we have, all of it ties together. And I think what, it, what we really try to do with workplace stability is say, just paying people more money is one resource of many. Um, and I think when we can apply that to those managers and supervisors sitting in chairs in these trainings, they, they, it really starts to make sense. They know it. Uh, it's not like we're, we're talking to people that are kind of dropping in from Mars and trying to learn everything. It, it just, again, what Bridges does, what Workplace Stability does, it gives some context and it gives a framework for understanding that then helps you to address and, and come to different strategies. Um, so the next slide kind of lists some things off that we talk about in our workplace stability trainings. Um, you know, one of the things that, I, that I've that i learned over the years in integrating some of this content into the business uh, world is that um, an, a, a, a successful business understands that, that their employees are the first clients or the first customers that they need to focus on. So whether it's a uh, healthcare industry, whether it's manufacturing, whether it's the service industry, if a business is really going to succeed, um, they need to value the, their employees and understand all the, the uh, pieces that come into that employee's life cycle just as much, if not more, uh, as they would do looking at their customers, their clients, their patients. Uh, we talk about the importance of what it looks like, understanding the realities of daily instability um, and how important relationships are. Then that points back to the workplace. What about mentors, role models, sponsors? How do you build structures into your business uh, environment that allows your employees to latch on to, to good trust-based relationships that are going to help them succeed? Um, I think one of the things we, we talk about a lot of times in these workplace stability trainings is 
what what are the hidden rules of your organization that make uh, create uh, barriers, unintentional barriers to employees being successful, whether it's uh, the type of language you use it, during break time. Uh, we had one business that uh, apparently had a table in their break room where people could bring um, food from home and different things that they want to share and they would just leave it there. But obviously the hidden rule is that you don't take everything on the table for yourself, um, but they had no uh, training for employees on what that meant and how to navigate something that looked really it was a great idea, just needed some more context around it. Um, and then of course, because of the nature of a lot of uh, situations and services and businesses that um, are really looking at workplace stability, we talk a lot about what, you, what unique ways uh, can be integrated and implemented to celebrate employees. We know that people that are dealing with daily instability are constantly um, kind of beaten down by life and uh, when, you, when we're talking with managers and supervisors, we can sometimes bring the aha moment that it doesn't take a ton of work to just celebrate someone. Maybe you, you recognize that someone uh, took three buses to show up to work on time today and, and to just acknowledge them privately, to celebrate publicly with their coworkers once in a while, different things, that can create an environment that's motivating for people to show up every day, especially when they're overcoming uh, massive amount of barriers uh, in their personal lives. So there's a lot to it. I think the, the the big idea I just wanted to get across is the translation of Bridges framework into uh, the, the workplace has been really powerful. It makes a ton of sense and I think it leads to some really creative solutions that employers are really able to look at in working with the people that they employ on a daily basis. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Nathan, for sharing that. That sounds like you've got some really great things as well happening in your community, and we'll take some questions about that at the end if anybody has any. Uh, next up, we have Terry, who is going to speak around bridges to health and health care. Good morning. I hope you can hear me, Susie. Yes, I can hear you. Thanks, Terry. Okay, thank you. I am very pleased to be with you today to talk about Bridges to Health and Healthcare and greetings from the Blue Ridge Mountains of South Carolina where I live and it is good to be here. Uh, first I'd like to talk to you about Bridges to Health and Healthcare but just briefly. Uh, the book was written in 2014 and as you can see Ruby and I co-authored along with Lucy Shaw and Jan Young who are um, nurse prep nurse nurses as well as uh, community health uh, leaders uh, in Memphis. Uh, so we've got both the medical and the community health um, individuals participating in uh, writing bridges and uh, bridges to health and healthcare. And it has proven to be very interesting since then. And I'm, I'm ready for the next slide. Uh, the thing that bridges to health and healthcare offers you if you're ready to go to the next slide, Susie. Thank you. Are uh, two, two or three things. First of all, what is the health uh, sector? It's pretty diverse. So when we think of the health sector, it has two main areas. One is public and community health, and the other is um, clinical health or medicine. But under clinical health, we also have oral health, behavioral health as well as you know physical therapists and so forth so it's pretty broad and um what happens is the bridges to health and healthcare actually builds on the research and the strategies and looks at the barriers that the health systems are currently um experience due to the problem of poverty and so how does poverty affect those systems so we make what we call the business case and we use the triple aim which is a very common model used in healthcare in order to do this so as you can see the triple aim is pretty much present in every sector but this is a particular model the health sector uses and there are three different areas that they're looking for one is to improve the health of the population 
What's interesting is about 20% of the population is using 80% of the resources. And so what that is called many times are the folks that keep coming back to the emergency department. Um, they're called frequent flyers. And so 20% of the folks have issues and, and poverty is one of those issues that continues to erode the bottom line. So when you look down to the right on this triangle, you see improve affordability and reduce cost. Interestingly enough, that reducing cost is not our out-of-pocket cost. That reducing cost is a business model to help um, health systems survive and communities survive and how do we address that when 20 percent of the folks are using 80 percent of the resources so as you can see we begin to look at how are community uh, organizations and businesses that are hospitals and medical services being reimbursed or paid for their services. So there's some ideas there, fee for service, value-based, capitation. So as you're beginning to present bridges, if you understand these things, you can attract the, the uh, health sector if you understand those. And Bridges to Health and Healthcare allows you to do that. On the bottom left is where Bridges really thrives and grows. And that is to improve the experience of the individual. And that would be the patient. So that would be called patient engagement. So of course, the most obvious part of Bridges is patient engagement. But if you look at this, um, it has patient engagement it has an impact uh, on improving the health of those at-risk populations who are using all of those resources. And it also can help uh, systems reduce cost. So some of the things that are measured in healthcare are uh, the number of times people have unnecessary readmissions to the hospital. That really dings the bottom line. And also uh, people using the emergency room as primary care and um, those types of things. So uh, also a non-treatment non-compliance. So people, you know, like are not following their treatment compliance. So the 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 research is that folks in poverty have higher levels of health issues just because of the stress of poverty. And then you have the access to health care, which is a barrier too. So part of the, the issue is how do we improve the experience of the individual so and the patient engagement? And how do we do that at the individual and the institutional and the community and policy level? So, so another piece, if we could move on to the next slide, Susie is um, we have champions. So we have health systems and community health that have already been using Bridges to Health and Healthcare. So we can share that with, with uh, our, our newer healthcare audience so that they can kind of get a sense of how that works. Advantage Dental in Oregon uh, was, one, it was one of our huge um, Bridges to Health and Healthcare champions and, and used it and just embedded Bridges to Health and Healthcare in many ways. Um, one of the things that they did was they, they had 250 dentists in this system and um, they actually had everyone in, in, in the entire system, of course, um, take the workshop, Bridges to Health and Healthcare, because they found that, that sometimes their, their staff was very judgmental of why people in poverty had made different choices um, on their uh, health, uh, their oral health. Um, not, for example, some of the hidden rules where you don't go to the dentist until your head's blowing up with pain. So they also did some institutional change, um, which is very interesting. So they used uh, motivational interviewing in the waiting area with patients who had come in with their head blowing up with pain and needed to see the dentist that day. Now, in the former days before Bridges to Health, they would just tell that person to go to the emergency department, which again is costing the system a lot of money. But what they did is in every one of their offices, and remember this is a big system with 250 dentists, they added a third chair. So you could go in and actually see a dentist that day. Um, because what they figured was when they looked at the mental model of poverty, they thought, oh my gosh, this is just a totally different world. What are the hidden rules of oral health inside this model, this environment of how you live and how, what are your priorities and so forth? And, and 
in relationships being a priority. All of those things are really critical to understand. And what they decided were, was that they were not going to change the tyranny of the moment of poverty. So they added that urgent share. In one of their counties, the number one reason people were going to the emergency department, which was very expensive for the system and for all of us, was because of oral health problems. After they implemented Bridges to Health and Healthcare, that became the number 10 reason, oral health was the number 10 reason people went to the emergency department. So we have outcomes. So basically what would happen is that, um, you know, folks would come in with their head blowing up. Now they were able to be seen in an hour, an hour and a half, and someone would actually come out and do motivational interviewing with them, build relationships. Terry, we've lost your audio. Okay, how long have you lost my audio? It only just happened. I think you're, okay, you're good. back. Okay, I'm ready to go to the next slide then. That's a that's a key <laughs> uh, sign for me. Um, this is some of the uh, population health research that shows that uh, below the poverty level, which the poverty level, of course, is, is, is we're all aware, is the federal poverty guidelines, which are about 25,000 for a family of four, 100% to 200% of poverty, which is typically what uh, we would call the working poor, and then 200% of poverty is, is supposedly sustainable and above that. So what you can see is even with uh, when this intersects race and ethnicity, you still have those below poverty level and those who may be working poor experiencing less health. So these are the kind of things we share in Bridges to Health and Healthcare that really have an impact on, on our health and community health systems that make them more eager to say, okay, we need to sit down and say, okay, how are we doing outreach? How are we doing treatment? How do we address those at-risk populations that are costing the system so much? And I know what you've seen is big health systems buying up smaller health systems. This is part of the process. I also want to mention that many hospitals have a lot of turnover and retention problems uh, in environmental services and food services employees, and they are using getting ahead to help their employees transition into uh, places of more stability and therefore be more uh, reliable and uh, functional and happy as employees in that system. So, you know, there's a lot of overlap here. Okay, Susie, on to the next one, please. This is a mental model for treatment compliance. And as we know, when I'm in poverty, especially generational poverty, I may be a very concrete processor. And, you know, the health system, just like every other of, of our sectors, is kind of like everything that comes out of our mouth is about choice and future story. It's kind of like a make your own luck world, right? And so what we're looking at here is how do you draw, how do you use mental models and sketch the treatment plan so that the patient can actually see what is happening in their past, their present, and their future. And if you look at that, in the past, that that uh, congestive heart failure has been weakening the heart strength of this patient who is a 63-year-old woman. And so now she has to make a choice. If she follows her treatment plan, which you see there, um, her, her heart may not get better, her heart strength will not get much worse. But if she doesn't follow her treatment plan, you can see it's going way down very quickly. And so you begin to talk about what do you want to be around for in the next three weeks, in the next three months? What do you want to go to? Go to attend a party? Is there someone being born that's important to you, a grandchild? You don't want to show up there in a wheelchair or be unable to go because you can't breathe. So you mark those on here. And when you hand this and you draw it with someone and hand this to them, it's much different than just saying, okay, you have to limit your salt. You have to weigh yourself every day. There's a real meaningful piece here that is embedded into bridges to health and healthcare. So there's much more that I could say, um, but I do want to say that in Schenectady, where Nathan is from, they are uh, reaching out to and, and, and using very creative outreach to homeless individuals and linking them to health resources, all as part of bridges and bridges to health and healthcare. It's really quite fabulous. So 
I went through this kind of quickly, but hopefully I uh, will get a few questions at the end. And uh, my email address is tdsmithbridges at gmail.com in case you have any questions for me. Thank you. Thanks so much, Terry, for that wealth of knowledge around Bridges to Healthcare. It's been helpful in our community as well to start speaking the language of health to our attendees that were going to Bridges workshop. So thank you. Next up, we have Gary, who is going Looks like, uh, it sounds like uh, occasionally something's kind of bleeping out there. So if it, uh, if it cuts off, well, let me know. Uh, yes, I'm Gary Reddick, and uh, we'll talk about tactical communication uh, for emergency responders. Uh, as many of you know, if you've been in the uh, Bridges program for very long, you know that uh, persons in poverty are disproportionately high users of emergency services, both police, fire, ambulance services. Uh, and if you're in the emergency services response business, you know that persons in poverty take up a great deal of your time, uh, again, we refer to those as frequent flyers or repeat customers uh, up and down the line, whether it's police, fire or ambulance services, emergency medical services, people tend to use those services in poverty at a higher rate than they do in middle income or in wealth. So what we're trying to do through tactical communication is to um, make emergency responders aware of both of the hidden rules, uh, of the poverty class and to get them to understand why it is that they see or view people in the poverty differently, uh, how to build relationships, uh, how to make those, those relationships successful. Um, tactical communication uh, is something that I advocate for if you're beginning to do a bridges program, uh, any, kind of, any kind of bridges program, having law enforcement, having emergency responders, having the criminal justice system as part of your program on your side as an advocate for you, as opposed to working against you or not understanding what you're trying to do. Uh, this makes a big difference. I think Treasurer McKenzie and the program there at Muskogee would agree that, that uh, one of their biggest partners and that's helped them overcome a lot of obstacles is the idea that the police department there and emergency responders have been on board their program and have supported the program. And we've done training down there as well for all of the officers uh, in, in that uh, municipality. Uh, so, yeah, uh, Susie, go on to the next slide. Uh, in tactical communication, uh, there are several things that we are looking to try to achieve when we train police officers and police uh, leaders, the, the leadership within law enforcement and in firefighting and in emergency medical services. One of those things, of course, is, is that we want to see our emergency responders' safety become improved. Physical conflict is always uh, at a higher proportion with persons in poverty, there's always a, a sense of conflict because of what uniform personnel represent. So what we're trying to do is get them to understand the hidden rules so that they can navigate and build those relationships better and their safety and their perception of people and how they perceive people, how they can read people is improved. Uh, one of the biggest things that we want to do in tactical is to de-escalate conflict. If you look at what has happened across the country when particularly when police issues uh, become problematic and escalate to a point where it makes national news uh, because of uh, the use of deadly force. That almost always starts at a very low point of conflict and escalates out of control. So how do we, how do we uh, teach people in law enforcement to de-escalate conflict in a manner that makes them safe, makes them effective, citizens are, are more pleased with the outcome. Um, and um, if you are in any locality where you're working with your law enforcement community, ask them this question, do you advocate for, or do you do community policing? The answer is always going to be yes. So when you're talking with the leadership in law enforcement or in criminal justice, uh, ask about community policing. It's, it's kind of the buzzword and what we're looking for is to, um, enlighten them on the ideas that tactical communication and the concepts through bridges in the framework for understanding poverty, all of those things support a community policing program. Community policing is very clearly um, uh, about building relationships with a community. What we're not doing when we advocate for community policing is we're not giving uh, emergency responders the tools necessary 
to build relationships and to be successful. We say relationships are important, and that's pretty much where it stops. When we talk about tactical, we're trying to give them tools on the tool belt um, that they can use day in and day out to Im improve their relationship building uh, abilities. Uh, next slide, Susie. Probably uh, uh, this is a list of some of the places that we presented, but more importantly, I want to focus on the blade here is the newspaper for the city of Toledo. Uh, AHA process and its consultants did training for the Toledo Police Department and a couple of other police departments there in the Toledo area. After that training was completed, within just a few days, they had the ultimate bad situation where a member of the poverty uh, minority community was shot and killed in a, in a police confrontation. What probably uh, most likely would have been a very bad situation, escalating out of control, uh, was in fact de-escalated and uh, made much better through the training applications of tactical and the Toledo Police Chief George Crowell uh, was the first one to say what we learned from our training in tactical communication and the officer said what we learned in our training from tactical communication helped us to de-escalate this conflict, helped us to be, remain safe, helped us to be not so frustrated with what was going on and the end result was uh, the, the community came together and saw themselves through this very difficult time through doing some different things that had tactical not been in place, they may not have done. So when you're when you're talking with law enforcement agencies or fire departments or emergency medical services, what we're really uh, trying to do is get them to understand what we can do differently in building relationships in the community to make them more effective. It's all about trying to make your emergency responders more effective in the community. And that helps that helps everyone, it helps the community at large. It's one of those resource issues that we're trying to really build up and focus on. So when we're um, when we're talking about doing these seminars, uh, we we want to make them understand first of all, this is not a program that um, is not without consequence. And we've talked about this before in, in this webinar today. Consequences are still present. We're not advocating for not arresting people. We're not arrest. We're not advocating for being soft on crime. What we're trying to do is understand how some of these things can be improved uh, through better understanding. So um, training uh, like this is, is essential if you're trying to do community policing, but also I think it's important if you're trying to implement bridges programs in your community. Uh, the, the criminal justice system and law enforcement in particular can really make you make it difficult on your clients uh, in a bridges program of any kind if they're not part of the solution. They need to be at the table, they need to have their place at the table, and they need to be supporting and advocating for your success. Because when your clients succeed, everyone succeeds in the community. So that's a little bit about the tactical uh, component there, and uh, I'll be glad to take questions at the end of the seminar if there are any. Thanks. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Gary. Uh, in Peterborough, we are hoping that we can start to move into this work as well with our first responders. So I find that really interesting as we're uh, considering ways to engage our first responders in some of this Bridges work. Uh, so finally, and I'm going to keep it short so that we have some time for questions, if anybody has questions for all of the presenters. Uh, finally, we're going to speak here about growing a Bridges community and what's happening uh, in the city of Peterborough uh, Peterborough, Ontario, Canada. So from north. Um, where we have been working a while at community. One of the core fundamental pieces though to note is that our divisional values match the, the values of the Bridges Out of Poverty program and so that's why I think it's been initially very successful in being able to embrace the philosophies of Bridges and uh, really work hard together and collaboratively to create a Bridges community. So part of our journey began back in 2012, which just started with a Bridges Out of Poverty uh, training day. So I'm sure that began for many of you as well who are listening today. And from there, we just were really adamant that we did not want to just have another workshop where everybody feels inspired and motivated and then they go back to their desk and don't change the way they actually conduct their business and their work with the people that we serve. And so we created an internal working group of champions that felt particularly uh, engaged and passionate about the work. 
And as a result, then I became certified as our uh, community trainer for Bridges back in 2000, oops, sorry, 2015. And we began um, leading community partners and offering training sessions because the City of Peterborough Social Services oversees many uh, contracts with many of our service providers. We receive the funding from the province and we flow it out in service agreements to lots of our partners. So we're in a position to be able to influence professional development for some of the, the places that we are funding to provide services for mutual clients in the community, many of which are coming from generational poverty. Uh, we then began, when we started to see some significant changes in the community work with training, uh, we, we moved on to Getting Ahead, which Treasure spoke about, and so I won't go into detail about that. But Getting Ahead and a Getting by World really is the glue to the community as far as starting to build a Bridges community together. And then Staying Ahead meetings, we've started to implement those earlier this year uh, to keep the momentum going for our Getting Ahead grads and keep building those resources that they learn about. Uh, and then additionally, and ironically, as it relates to this webinar, starting to see that we had more interest from private sectors, employers, uh, you know, even landlords and healthcare professionals and schools, we decided that we needed to tailor our presentations and not just keep it Bridges Out of Poverty Strategies for Professionals, but also to start to create and offer these workshops as our presenters have been talking about already to different sectors in our community. And so I won't read this slide. It will be a part of your recording that you'll get. Um, everyone will, will have access to this, but this was some of the steps that we've been taking as a community to embed at the individual level, the institutional level, and the community level, the constructs of bridges uh, and working collaboratively with our community partners. Just a few things that I wanna jump out at in the institutional lens is really about normalizing the concepts from all levels of the organization, creating a people-centered culture at all levels of the organization, because your leaders can't not walk the walk. Your leaders in any organization need to stand behind the constructs and that relationships count um, just as much as any of the frontline staff do so that you can all walk through this journey together. And then you'll start to create policies, programs, and procedures that will match the population that you're serving and really try to uh, build that Bridges community from the institutional lens and then moving into the community lens around uh, providing the training in getting ahead, uh, staying ahead workshops, sector work, our workplace stability workshops have really gone over well. We have employers. I think speaking the language of business makes a big difference because we were providing bridges overviews for employers and they were engaged. But as soon as we changed our language to the, wor the words of, uh, you know, that attracts the businesses, uh, that started to really tweak the interest. Uh, and training partners in further uh, embedding of life stabilization and case management and uh, building those 11 resources that we learn about in Bridges for improved overall quality, quality of life. Um, so yeah, I'm excited to talk about what's been happening in Peterborough. I'm just being mindful of the time and making sure that we have time for questions for anyone that is on the line. Um, but you know, we're all working hard to build Bridges communities as I'm sure many of you are as well and for common goals. We want everyone to thrive and this sector work is really important to start branching out. So I guess after this presentation, uh, you know, we would ask, are you still using Bridges workshops with other sectors? And if so, uh, hopefully our presentations have helped you in considering talking sector language um, using these different workshops and how you can start to reach some different outcomes. So we've only got about seven minutes left and uh, we'll open it up to see if anybody's got any questions for any of our presenters on any of this information. on the line for a few minutes and maybe people are typing quickly away to ask some questions about 
any of our presentations. Um, I'm sure that there may be questions about what other communities are doing as well. And uh, this is a start of some of that, explaining some of the sector work on those initial couple of slides on building bridges communities. We'll just wait. Everybody, okay, we'll just wait a few minutes to see if anybody is typing away. This is Nathan. Can I throw out a question quickly? Sure. Uh, this one's for Treasure, uh, related to getting ahead, more specifically staying ahead. Was the, the staying ahead work also funded and integrated into that large five-year grant, or did you do funding for those separately? Great question. Um, the five-year grant obviously was set five years ago and cannot be changed. And at that time, we didn't have any staying ahead classes. So everything we've added since then has had to be funded differently. And the great thing about the financial literacy classes is, is that the banks really, really wanted to fund them. And so we've been able to add extra food, add extra child care for the, those classes that are additional. The boundaries class was very minimal um, expenses just because we bought some books on Amazon and they're like $8 each. And the um, curriculum that we found for Parent University was also free. And so... Nice. Um, it would just kind of worked out that way just because of the curriculum that we chose for those classes. And who's uh, facilitating those staying ahead classes and your current getting ahead classes? Okay, I for the financial literacy class, I have a local uh, retired accountant who stepped up and wanted to teach that. I teach some of them as well. Um, the boundaries class is a, is a, a volunteer that has taught the class for 20 years in a church that she was attending earlier in her life and stepped up and wanted to volunteer in the parent university class. It's kind of, But all of these classes are kind of self-book taught as well. Um, and the parent university class is where you just go to a little workshop and learn it and we all work out of the book. Got it. The so volunteers. Thanks, Nathan. Thank you. We do have a question here on who won the 2017 and 2018 Community uh, Getting Ahead Awards. And I don't know that off the top of my head. Does any of our presenters know that? Treasure, do you know who won the 2017, 27, oh my gosh, 2017 and 2018? I can't remember, but I think Eureka Springs, Arkansas won last year. I believe Hot Springs in Hot Springs, oh, Hot Arkansas. Springs. Arkansas a one in 2017, Marion Matters in Marion, Ohio, one in 2018, and Toledo, Ohio, one in 2019. Great. Thanks, Ruth, for clarifying that. Gary, I have a question for you in Peterborough as we're trying to uh, figure out how to engage our first responders. I've had police officers, a few of them, uh, come join for a Bridges at a Poverty workshop. And they all, you know, afterwards, I've had about six or eight of them, and they've all said, this is great work, and this needs to get into the police services here, and we need to, you know, attract them, but we don't, we don't have the time. Mm -hmm. And so is there anything that you do to... You know, other than your obviously what you said so far, but do you have any techniques or, or what we could say to try and attract them to be able to give us a little bit of their time for the bridges work? Susie, typically what you see in police departments because you have 24 hour shift work is that it's very difficult to get all the, uh, the street officers, particularly, uh, into um, a training session at the same time. You're just not going to be able to close down the police department. Calls for service still go on. Investigations still go on. So uh, what we've done or what I've done is, first of all, I've, I've kind of minimized this training course down to a four-hour block. So we do it for four hours. And uh, as I've done for recently for the Stewart Police Department, we've varied the times. Uh, I've done a training session for them from uh, 8.30 to 12.30 from 9 to 1. I have done one in the evening from 4 to 8 so that we're able to get different shift work. And I think we may have even done the same thing uh, for Treasure down in Muskogee. We, we staggered the time so that uh, they were able not to miss their entire shift of work and to make it shift um, uh, shift optional there. So based on their, their uh, 
shift schedule. Usually a day shift is like seven to three. So we could do a an 11 to three o'clock period. And then you're going to have to come back, you know, to hit them. And that's what we've been doing at Stewart is they've made it an annual training. The other thing that we want uh, law enforcement officers to consider or executives to consider is to incorporate this training as part of their um, academy training for their their new hires so i don't know how large the police department is at P petersburg or how how uh, they're trained if they're sending them to a state state academy but if we can get in there and do a four-hour block and catch them there then we're getting them right on the ground floor before they ever hit the streets that's a great idea okay thank you so i'm not seeing any other questions typed in the question box and we are at one o'clock So Leonard, we're going to end okay, the call well, now. Thanks. Yeah, are we good to okay. end the call? Yes, I'll, I'll end it for you. Uh, thank you all, all of y'all for being on today and giving us some great valuable information. And thank you everybody for attending today's uh, session. We really appreciate your time. We know you're busy and we always love it when you join uh, us for a webinar. So thanks everybody and have a good day. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye. Oh, bye. <laughs> Couple more.